I would like to introduce our first speaker of the evening. Um, if you've seen Flutter Interact in December, you'll remember Splice, uh, a music production platform with access to millions of royalty-free samples. They recently built their mobile companion app in Flutter, and principal enge engineer Angelina Favreau will tell us all about the architectural decisions they made. Angelina is a technical lead at Splice and has taught programmers new skills across multiple languages on the topics of software architecture, web development, graphics performance, and cloud computing infrastructure in over 20 countries. So let's give a big, loud Flutter NYC welcome to Angelina Favreau. So yeah, uh, I am Angelina Favreau, and as mentioned, I am a principal engineer at Splice. And it's, I think it's more fair to say I was the technical lead on the mobile application, because these days I'm working on our desktop application. And maybe in the near future, we might be looking at other places to use Flutter, but that's all I'll say about that. Um, and I'm here today to tell you the story about how we built our app in Flutter, because we're hoping that our experiences can help you build your app with a little bit more confidence. You know, Flutter is a fairly new framework. A lot of us that are in the room, I mean, self-included, I've been writing Flutter for less than a year. Um, there aren't a lot of Flutter experts. I don't consider myself one, but if we all work together on this, you know, we'll, we'll get there. We all will be. So what is Splice, right? Um, as Martin said, you know, uh, we have a giant catalog of royalty cleared samples, but like, why would you want that? What would you need that for? So imagine that you're a musician and you're writing a song. Maybe you're a music producer, you want to be the next Skrillex out there. And you're looking for the exact right sound that fits the mood that you're in, or perhaps you're a composer writing for a creative brief and for a film. Splice has this giant library of rights cleared samples, and so what that means is that you pay us a subscription per month, and then any of those sounds that you use, you don't have to worry about all of the licensing details, basically. We give you the, the license to use that sound. So you can then go on and sell that song without having somebody show up in your biscuits later and be like, what's the deal? Um, so it's bits, bits and pieces of music that you can use. Everything from drum loops to piano chords, uh, trumpet licks, bird sounds, we've got laser zaps, and even the sound of London in the rain. Uh, we have sounds and ideas from thousands of well-known artists. Uh, you know, if you're into EDM, you might recognize Dead Mouse and Steve Aoki. So Splice ho essentially helps you find the right sounds when you're making music. But why build a mobile application for something like that when music production largely happens on desktop computers like this, right? Like the typical workflow is uh, somebody records, you know, maybe some live instruments, they sit down in front of Ableton or Logic, and that's where beats and tracks are made these days. You can kind of think of the Splice mobile application a little bit like photo filtering apps, right? So maybe you take some photos on your phone or you've got them in a Google Drive from like a really nice, a really nice camera and you just play around with the filters. But the real work happens when you get back to the desktop and you're sitting down in, what is it, Lightroom? You can tell I know a ton about photography, but uh, and you're in one of those applications. So we kind of look at it as a tool for inspiration. We had this hypothesis, right? It would be useful for somebody to build their library of sounds on the go and to have them available for them later. And so to validate our hypothesis, we built our mobile application in Flutter. After trying Flutter, fell in love with the developer experience. Um, for us, you know, we knew that separate iOS and Android teams were a non-starter. The speed to validate our hypothesis was critical. Um, the app was built by myself and another principal engineer, along with a designer who's working with us part-time and one product manager, which, as you know, is an incredibly small team. We were asked to build and ship an app, have it into the app stores, both of them, in six weeks. We did it. Uh, we <laughs> which is very weird to look back on. But yeah, we did it uh, by having a very, very tight scope of features and uh, by working really closely and diligently, we managed to, to do that. But the reason why we hold, held ourselves this really tight timeline for an MVP is because we still weren't really sure that our customers wanted this, right? And we didn't want to plan out a three month, six month, whole year project only to be like, great, well, we spent how many millions of dollars on R&D only to learn that nobody wanted this. We wanted to start getting that user feedback like yesterday. Um, so that was really the goal. And the good news was that uh, when we started getting reviews for the app, it, was, it wasn't like, no, we don't want this. It was, why, didn't you sh why did you ship the app without this? Why doesn't the search work exactly like, like there were good complaints to have. It was, it was people wanting more rather than why did you waste our time? So we have been developing the app since. So, you know, we're new to this new framework called Flutter, and we have this app that we know is going to be something of an extension of the marketplace that we have on the web. And in our case, this is what influenced how we built the first version, right? 
Um, so these were some of the, con the constraints we had. We knew we had an existing marketplace API. We were not building an API from scratch that was off the table. Um, we had to use a splice design system, which we have components for in our Angular applications in the web, but don't exist yet in Flutter. So we knew that there was going to be a lot of custom theming, and we weren't necessarily going to be using a lot of off-the-shelf native components. Um, we knew that we wanted to definitely ship on both iOS and Android. Thankfully, you know, Flutter gives us that for free, kind of, in a way. Um, it's a music app. It's got to play audio. Seems kind of a given. And yeah, we had to scope whatever we were building to about four weeks of dev, and then we had two weeks where it was like kind of a bleed over, test, you know, polish, and then get it into the app store. And it's funny because like constraints are really important, right? I love constraints. Constraints drive creativity. And to get a little philosophical for a moment, you know, if a problem has no bounds, can it really be solved? Hmm, I don't know. I hope that keeps you up at night like it does me. <laughs> and how do these constraints affect what is maintainable over time in your code? Like to me, these three things here are kind of what I like to keep in mind as I write an application, right? Like if this project is a, is a, a success and it grows, how am I going to onboard new people? What are they going to think about it? The mental model shouldn't require a million files open in my editor, and it doesn't require too much abstraction, you know, of, of these components. So this is something from the Flutter style guide, and I actually absolutely love this because it embodies the working principles we set up with on the project. But it's kind of funny because I didn't really read the style guide until like a couple weeks ago. So write what you need and no more, and when you write it, do it right. Avoid implementing features you don't need. You can't design a feature without knowing what the constraints are. If you implement a feature you know, for completeness, the result is unused code that is expensive to maintain, learn about, document, test. And I really believe that in my heart of hearts. You know, but at a high level, we still had to have some direction on how to organize the app. You know, we did some research, which involved uh, some of our own experiments, just, just build something and see what works. We spoke with the folks at Very Good Ventures who gave us some of their time and we asked some questions. Um, we spoke with, you know, Flutter, Flutter DevRel uh, before we moved forward with our strategy. So, block. It's the most popular thing you're going to find when you look up Flutter architectural patterns on the internet. It's very, very popular. And I like this particular representation of block. This is usually what I show to people when, when you know, someone's like, well, why didn't we use block? Or I'm trying to learn block. Because um, if you're a developer coming from another language paradigm, you know, like a lot of people at this meetup, uh, this has some analogs in it to patterns you know, like a, a view model is an abstraction more people are familiar with than you know, like a block, for example. Um, but, uh, you know, so one of the great things about Block is that it has a very clear separation of concerns and provides basically, you know, in, in a large sense, an interface around streams. But like any architectural abstraction, it carries the, the burden of cognitive overhead. The abstractions here in this particular case, I feel like, really assume that you need a place to put significant business logic. But the thing is, in the case of the Splice app, we realized that we were just pulling data over the wire and there wasn't significant transformation. Um, and we were caching a lot of it. Like we cache requests and you know, we don't maintain a lot of state. We actually tend to, to blow it away because the content changes to something really fresh on the home page a lot. So for us, you know, we started to look at this and you know, recall earlier how we made a commitment to only build what we need and not to build for the sake of completeness. And we started to realize that maybe block wasn't going to be for us. Um, so if you're feeling like you just don't get block, or you're having trouble, uh, f you know, f fitting it to your use case, you know, you're not alone. Maybe block just isn't for you, or maybe your app just isn't, you know, uh, complicated enough yet to need it. And I feel similarly about patterns like Redux too, if you're familiar with that. Like it does solve a problem, absolutely. Block is fantastic for a particular set of problems, but ask yourself if those extra abstractions are really going to be worth the cost, the maintenance cost long term. So I like to say to people that, you know, less can be more until you're talking about documentation or ternary operators. Just my two cents. So what did, we, what did we end up doing, right? Well, we ended up on an architecture that's kind of like this. Block didn't end up being the right thing. So we knew that in our application that we didn't have a lot of business logic, as I said, and there are a certain set of features that we knew needed to be present in the app kind of almost everywhere. For example, the app is so based around sales. Sales are what we're selling. The whole app, as it stands today, is something of a marketplace. So we started to think to ourselves, what kind of an object would we design that could serve you know, the needs across the app without necessarily maintaining a ton of state 
or um, becoming a kitchen sink. And sort of what we landed on is this idea of a service object, right? These service objects are responsible for a collection of responsibilities by theme. So for example, in the app, we do have an authentication service. Can anybody guess what the authentication service does? Thank you, log in, log out. Um, it, I believe our authentication service also takes care of um, checking on disk to see if we have a user session cache because we don't want the log user having to log in every time. And it will, it will talk to the API for us and then make that information available to whatever view happens to need it. Now you're gonna see models there, right? You might be thinking, okay, these services get the data and what do they do with it? Well, as I mentioned before, in our particular case, we don't need to do any significant transformation. So we use generated models, JSON serialization, and essentially, like, we cache the network requests and then when we need new ones, we make new ones, and if we don't, we've just got these models kicking around and we're using basically the exact models that we have in our domain model everywhere else. Now, this, is, this works for us, it might not work for you, um, but so far, we've kept our models really as dumb as possible. There is no view model, there's no, there's nothing like that. Um, occasionally, the result of this is that you do find that a view can get a little bit, a little bit big. And if we sort of ask ourselves, if we ever find ourselves putting um, like business logic into a view, is this something that's used in more than one place? Okay, maybe then it becomes a service and we have a service object. If it doesn't, then maybe we start introducing something that's a little bit intermediate, like a kind of controller or something like that. But for, for the most part, we have very, very few of those objects in the app. Like our real principle here has been to keep things as simple as long as possible. What can we get out of using, say, the stock flutter widgets without too much embellishment? Um, you know, streams are really popular, and then it's funny because when people start talking about streams with Flutter, they're like, oh, but then you have to use RX Dart. And I'm like, do I have to use RX Dart? Do you know what I mean? Like, we actually did end up using a behavior subject for one particular application in the app, but by and large, the, the Dart built-ins really did us, did us proud. And I think that this is a, an important point because if you, if you work this way, as you're learning a new technology, it really forces you to go deep on the core tools. And that's a huge benefit to you when you're onboarding people later and you know them really intimately. And then you have such a good sense when you start a new project about what you need and you don't need. And you can be true to those earlier principles that we talked about where like, you know, don't over-engineer things. And listen, I'm the first person to admit that like, I love cool new things, like I really do. And I have a tendency, like a lot of developers, especially, you know, I feel like as developers know enough to be dangerous in the middle of their career, we have a tendency to over-engineer things. Resist that urge, it's a trap. Cool, all right. So I thought what might be interesting here is to actually go take a look at kind of the layout on disk and show you like what we have and where. Um, and then from there, maybe I'll open it up for some questions. You know, what's tricky here is like, I can't show you everything, all of it, because there's a lot, right? Like what we did with state management, streams, this and that, but I can give you a sense of the direction we went in, because I actually think at the highest level that is probably what is the most helpful, because when people ask me about Flutter, they always ask me about Block, and I think that I've given the bulk of this talk a million times already, because it's that common of a problem. So, one second, let me get this up on the screen. Okay, so uh, hopefully this is big enough. If it's not, tell me and I will embiggen. And uh, I mean, what are we looking at right now? Um, we're looking at splashview.dart, but that's actually not what I wanted to pay attention to. I want you to look over here in the sidebar, right? So this is hopefully very familiar to most people who have done like a generated Flutter project. And that's like, you've kind of got, you know, you've got your lib folder, you've got your iOS folder, you've got your Android, all your specifics for the platform. And, and you know, if you're new to Flutter, uh, you know, all the, the, the good stuff lives in lib, so we'll expand that. And what you can see here is at the root, we've essentially got main.dart, which has the entry point for our program. And what we actually have in here too is we have some stuff that really early on uh, initiates a, an error handling service for us to make sure our errors get bubbled up in a way that, that works for us. Um, we also have an analytics service that we, we pipe behavioral events to that we want to initialize as early as possible. Um, and then we have like, you know, some config for us like disabling landscape mode, some, some stuff like that that you're gonna find that's specific to you. And we also happen to have, um, we've got some stuff in here that uh, manages uh, sort of changing app lifecycle state because some of our behavioral analytics relies on determining whether the user is background of the app, come back, et cetera, like that. Um, but back over here, uh, you'll notice that we have at the, the sort of top level of lib, we've got a core and we have a UI. And so this is kind of our, our weird way of kind of creating a distinction between the front end 
and the back end in the context of the app. So in UI, unsurprisingly, we have grouped by view or screen the sets of widgets that are particular to that screen. You know, I've worked in other uh, paradigms before where like model view controller and they'll be like your models folder, your views folder, your controllers folder. I don't know, I kind of just like to put things that are along the same theme together the most, as most as possible, do you know what I mean? Because it's, it's just always like a lot of, a big mental model for me to keep track of. I think that that's maybe a controversial thing, but we decided to do things this way. So like when you first go into the app, you've got like your browse view, and you can see here that we have uh, all the adjacent sort of components of it. So uh, when we were looking at the Splice app earlier, you might have seen these things that look like album covers. Those are packs of samples, and they are essentially albums of samples. And so uh, in that view, you know, that would have been instantiated by this, this pack card. So at the UI level, we essentially have things grouped by screen, by view. And then we also have like a, a shared folder here, which is uh, you know, reusable components from our design system and our theme data, so that, that can be used everywhere in the app. So we keep, we keep that pretty simple. Um, and then, uh, so I talked a little bit about services. And so how we're getting those services around the app is we chose to do that with dependency injection. And we're using the get it package. Has anybody here used the get it package before? Okay, so not, not too many people. So what it does is it sets up this ob object that we call a locator, and it allows you basically to uh, create a singleton object. Um, singleton pattern means that there's only ever one of that object alive in the app at a given point. Singleton objects, people really love them or they really hate them. Now, I would say that they're the kind of thing that you use judiciously. If you use them everywhere all the time, your entire architecture gets coupled to the idea that you've got all these god objects that live all the time and are always present, and that kind of creates a certain kind of inflexibility. But for us, you know, uh, some of these things do need to be alive all the time. We always want the analytic service, for example, to be available in every screen ever. Um, the authentication service, eh, you know, I'm gonna argue maybe that doesn't need to be a singleton, we can refactor that, all right. Um, but the Splice API, the player service, the sound service, like those things are kind of the core, the core of our app. And so what you do is when you configure this object here, you can go into a, uh, let's see, let's pick, um, we can pick, uh, let's see, we'll go into services and we'll take a look at um, player service. This is probably gonna use some of the singletons. Maybe, maybe, I might be wrong. Um, audio player. Well, we definitely use them somewhere, I know that. Uh, what about sound service? Yeah, here we go. Sound service is calling on the locator for the instantiated analytic service object. And so that's just sort of how we do a dependency injection here at Splice. And for us, it's actually gone, gone pretty all right. You know, um, I think maybe as the app grows and changes and we have more screens that um, you know become that have like a much deeper level of widget nesting. Perhaps we'll look more at like uh, something like providers to do like sort of a, a, an inheritance pattern that way. But for us, we've kept a lot of our widget trees actually really shallow. So we we found that like other than just like needing to pepper in this logic that we find is common to so many views that we haven't necessarily invested in in that so much. Um, all right, cool. So now that we've dove into this core folder a little bit, you can see that we've got a little bit of typing hanging out here. Uh, I mentioned before that our models are essentially, you know, they're, they're uh, annotated JSON that creates these generated models for us, and none of these have any business logic attached to them. And then lastly, you can see these are the implementations of our services, right? I mentioned that we have a sound service, which will take care of doing things like purchasing a pack, purchasing a sample, and it interacts with both our analytic service and our API. So uh, models don't know anything. Views can talk to services, and services can sometimes talk to other services. That's how it works. Um, cool, so that is about as far into this that I scripted. Don't know what else is gonna be interesting to you. Don't know if any of it is, but like, uh, ask me some questions. What's up? Uh, slightly off topic, but because it's a, such a sound-focused app, can yeah. you talk a little bit about 
you know, how much into the sort of fundamentals of iOS and Android you had to get to be happy with whatever it is that you feel like you needed the app to do? Excellent question. And you know, in anticipation of building this app, I went to Richard Heap's talk at this very meetup because I wasn't sure how much platform plugin writing we were going to do. Turns out, none. Uh, so we use a package that is called, I think, Audio Players or Audio Players 2. Um, and that one basically provides us a lot of the, the built-in stuff that we need that abstracts away all of the platform level specifics so we didn't have to write it ourselves. However, I have very strong reasons to believe that in the future we will be looking at doing more complicated things on the device with sound, like we're talking audio manipulation, things like pitch shifting and time stretching, uh, for which you know we have to develop uh, sort of the libraries and wrappers around uh, the the basically the code, the DSP code that we have for that. And so in that case, um, I definitely see in our future that we're going to be writing some platform plugins and maybe taking advantage of FFI. We've done some experiments with that already. What's been really interesting to me is that um, a lot of the a lot of the issues actually to me aren't really about like writing the plugin part of it. That is just like boiler boilerplate and shoveling like floats around and different kinds of numbers. Um, but some of the libraries we've been looking at are written in C++ and need a little bit of massaging in order to compile because largely FFI interfaces with C. So when looking at the libraries, that's actually been a little bit tough for us because it's like, well, you know, can we dispense with some of these C++ features, make it easier for like the compilation arrangement that we kind of want to find ourselves in. So that's, that's the thing we're exploring right now. How's the testing scenario? Oh, the testing scenario. Oh, man, it is not good. Um, <laughs> listen, OK, let's be real. I had to write an app in four weeks and ship it in six. You think we tested everything? Let's just be real. We didn't test everything. Um, and actually, so we had some challenges with the Flutter test runner. Um, the challenge for us, and actually, where's, where's Stefan? Stefan over there, Stefan is new to our team, has been learning Flutter uh, on the job, has been doing great, and uh, we are all very grateful that um, from, we, I think we started with like some pairing and then Stefan ran with it, but figured out why our tests, particularly our UI tests, were not working. So we had someone from our QA team come to us, and her name's Kath, and Kath's like, Angelina, I want to write some black box tests. And I'm like, great, that's fantastic, because our tests suck. Um, and she's like, but I'm trying to use keys to get at a particular element on the screen to wait so that I can actually like you know do the the faux the faux click in this in this in this uh, with the test runner and it just wouldn't work and so you know Steph and I ended up like on a call with Kath basically going from like okay let's like write tests not in our app using the key make sure we have a reality check totally work fine and eventually what ended up happening is we have a reusable component that abstracts away the platform checking. We do serve up some specific UI in the case of iOS and some specific UI in the case of Android, and we do do some platform specific things. So once upon a time, uh, we wrote a, a, like a little widget that abstracts away sort of like the if else so that it's very tidy and you don't have to repeat it everywhere. Well, what's interesting is that uh, we, we have like a case or a switch in there or whatever that uh, checks for iOS, Android, oh, but it, what was it, Stefan? It didn't check for anything else. Anything else, and the default case wasn't handled, um, and so it, it just was getting stuck there, and then nothing would render after that point. Like the test runner didn't know what to do because apparently in the test runner environment, it comes through as like desktop now, like Darwin. Darwin or something, because you know Flutter is now going to be running on the desktop. That's a part of the the beautiful Flutter promise. So it's just really funny that. It's, 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 it was a bug that was easy to fix, but like difficult to diagnose because uh, the test runner um, just kind of failed quietly, and we had to dig really, really deep into the, the tree. And then you know, Stefan noticed like I think this might be it. And as soon as he said it, I was like, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, so now uh, the tests work, and we have a lot more of them. And now it's good. The end. <laughs> oh, give the mic. Yeah, it's, it's going to be recorded. So thanks for your patience. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so my question is in relation to um, the data models uh, yeah. that were automatically generated, pro generation, yes. and the uh, JSON server that you yep. um, What uh, package was utilized there, if there was one, or was there any concentration? Let's go look at the pub spec, because I don't remember. Then I can, I can actually tell you what we used for the audio player, too. Um, Pub spec, that's the dot lock, that's fine, right, YAML? Uh, let's take a look. Here's, here's some stuff we're using. All right. Um, 
Share preferences, Sentry. Um, get it, provider. Oh, we are using a package that is literally called JSON underscore annotation. And if you want to get real specific, version two or above. Um, and then uh, for audio, yeah, obviously uh, that was it. It's called not audio player, but audio players. I think we ended up using the one that doesn't have an S on the end, and I recall that we had some challenges with it, so we ended up landing on audio players. Thank you. How about one more question? Okay, again, yeah, you gotta gotta get it back there. This is more of an architectural question, cool. and going back to the whole point of only building what you need and not over-engineering. Long story short, in my in current flutter apps that I've built and I'm building so far, managing a collection of dependencies has been a bit of a, a challenge, like creating a class that just encapsulates a ton of yes, needs, yes. and then deciding what dependencies to scope. So my question is, should I in keeping it simple, just use something like provider, like multi-provider to chain these dependencies instead of creating an implementation that would just be a front end to them that I could still use a multi-provider, but you would basically be wrapping them in a class, encapsulating in a class, and then using multi-provider to basically source them. I through, their, through, their, through their getter methods. I mean, it's difficult to comment on an implementation no, I haven't seen, but I do think that, um, you know, if I were starting to build this app today, I think I would take provider and change notifiers a little bit more seriously than I did. Because keep in mind here, like these things have changed a lot in the last oh, yeah. year. So I would, I would suggest using that pattern because I think it's a lot more mature than... Oh, yeah. Like, I'm just saying, like, would it make sense to just create a, a you know, a whole list of multi-providers at the top where you're going to, you know, at, as a as a means of like dependency injection or should you abstract it away within the class that provides Imagine a class that provides all these dependencies, like the equivalent would be like a, a Dagger component, for example, in Android. So okay. that class basically acts as a front end for every module that you add. So think about it that way, like a component class that's created as a first, me a first member of that multi-provider list, but then everything out below it, after it, will just call it, call that component and then just return whatever uh, dependencies provided. In that, in its own provider widget, in that, in, in the multi provider. It does sound a lot like you're talking about, like what I was talking about with the dependency injection, the service object, but imagine having like a master service object. Yeah, it's kind of like a scope. The way I see yeah, it, it's like a scope yeah. object where you have a bunch of dependencies that are, that you encapsulate, but instead of just uh, doing it for each individual provider by calling provider up to find yeah. them in the, in the tree, you know. Which one would, would make sense? Like encapsulating them in one in one object for that particular section you want to use them in, or just create them like one by one within multi provider. Which one is like, easier for you to read? After yeah, like minute? for I'm not talking about me. I'm talking. Talking about like for onboarding other developers. Oh, absolutely. Like, That's exactly why I asked this question back to you. It's like you know, like we have a tendency to to like try and over engineer things, even though we know that's not what we're trying to do. Like you, you really got to be asking yourself every step of the way. It's like, okay, maybe this isn't the perfect like ideal abstraction, but is it is it readable? Can he like like you said yeah. that you're hiring? Have you hired anyone else recently? Like they are more fit to give feedback on this than I would be. As I mean, I'm like one of like two. Well, one of three, uh, one of three other developers that also work that also uh, work with Flutter. I'm I'm like the lead for for all of them, but it's hard to get you know it's hard to get a little bit of opinions. But you know, especially if they don't know it. But based on what I've seen so far, I feel like I'm putting a burden on having the end user, the other developer, implement this base class that encapsulates that dependencies. Whereas it would just be easier for them to just create a bunch of providers and multi-provider. Based on the sentence you just gave me, you have your answer, sir. I You're going to do yeah. providers. Okay. I mean, it makes sense for top-level API, uh, you know, for creating a library, yeah. But for everything else, yeah, I think it makes sense for provider, for multi-provider. Thank you. Cool. Well, um, thank you, everybody, for having me. Thank you for coming to Splice. Come work with me.